Good morning, everyone. It is Sunday, October 4th, and this is Worldwide Communion Sunday. So happy to have you joining us today. We are going to be celebrating communion uh, at the end of our service today. So if you haven't got your bread and your juice ready uh, with you at home, uh, why don't you just turn off the computer and go and get that ready and then uh, come back and join us and we'll carry on with our service. Just a couple of announcements uh, today. First, a thank you to all of our participants in our service today again. Uh, we just couldn't do these uh, services without Tim and uh, Carol and uh, David and uh, Mary and Jane singing for us. Uh, both David, Fries and I uh, are eternally grateful for everyone's help and dedication. Um, a couple of things. Uh, we've been talking back and forth about reopening our uh, church for services on Sunday, maybe a one-off here and there. But uh, just given all of the recent occurrences in the province, uh, we're maybe just a little bit um, shy of, of doing that at this time. So just watch for the announcements that come out from Patty. And when we're ready to uh, let you back into the sanctuary, uh, we'll be more than happy to do that. We will joyfully uh, open again when we pos as soon as we possibly can. And the last thing to uh, remind you about is our online auction, which is happening on October 22nd. And um, if you want to even watch the auction online, you need to register. And you register at SydenhamAuctions.com, SydenhamAuction.com. And um, just, you know, you go in there, you press a button, you register, and pretty soon you're ready to go. You don't have to buy anything, uh, but if you want to participate as an observer, you still need to register. So with all of those announcements now finished, it's time for our prelude. going to begin with our welcome song, which is, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there, I am there.
Friends, may the light of Christ be present in our hearts and our minds. May the light of Christ fill our worship with love and bring our best intentions to the fore. May the light of Christ stay with us when we leave this time and bless us forever. Amen. Let our worship today be a song of praise to the maker. Let's open our hearts with abandon like the lilies of the field. Let our voices spill into the world like a fountain of joy. Let us gather together in circles of one or two or three. Let us join hands across the divides of internet space and light candles of hope for a world in pain. Let us come with open spirits ready to be renewed. Let us come with open hearts ready to be filled. Let us come with body, mind, and spirit, ready to hear words of hope and comfort. Let us come to find beauty and love right here where we are. Let us come together as the body of Christ and rejoice that there has never been a moment such as this, nor will there ever be again. Amen. And our first hymn is number 226, number 226, For the Beauty of the Earth. Let's take a moment for prayer. Let us pray. May we find the source of love and light in our hearts and minds today. May we find peace, courage, and strength for the living of these COVID days. May we find space at our table and in our hearts for the poor, for the lonely, for the despairing. May we find abundance at our table and be moved to share our many gifts with the less fortunate. May we be struck with the beauty all around us and find beauty in the faces of those right before us. 
and may our souls open to the beauty of God's love and shine from deep within. And having spent these few minutes together today, may our hours and days this week be filled with beauty, hope, and love. Amen. Friends, a couple of scripture readings uh, for us. The first one from Psalm 62. And if you have the printed version of the service with you, there is a refrain, and uh, I will say it anyways, but uh, if you want to say it along with me, uh, that would be great. In God alone is my soul at rest, the God who is my help. God is my rock, my strength and my hope, my fortress and my light. How long will fear be the ruler of my life? How long will it hold me in its grip? I desire to live fully, to take pleasure in my gifts, and to dwell in this world in comfort. In God alone is my soul at rest, the God who is my help. God is my rock, my strength and my hope, my fortress and my light. So now my soul waits in silence. I wait for the beloved who brings hope. The beloved enfolds me with steadfast love. My faith remains firm. Held firm in the silence, my freedom and my guidance speak. They speak to me of love, the love of the divine heart. In God alone is my soul at rest, the God who is my help. God is my rock, my strength, and my hope, my fortress, and my light. Once love spoke, I heard it twice. To you, O God, my beloved, I look for faithful love. You return it to me, just as I offer it to you. From your heart comes life, love, and light. In God alone is my soul at rest, the God who is my help. God is my rock, my strength, and my hope, my fortress, and my light. Amen. Now our second reading is from Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 6. Very familiar words from the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is life not more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air, they do not sow or reap, or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them, are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If this is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek first his kingdom, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Wise words for COVID time. Well, it turns out that beauty is not only in the eye of the beholder, beauty is in the soul of the beholder. Now, many people, and maybe even some of you these days, would argue that there is no such thing as a human soul. 
that we are evolved beings, we all agree with, but that the concept of soul is just a way of talking about the accumulated, learned responses to stimuli or another less apparent brain function. But I think I have an argument that would counter those claims for the existence of the soul, and it is one word, beauty. Beauty. Beauty resonates in a deep place inside of us. It is evoked. It arises naturally when in the presence of something beautiful. It is always a fleeting gift, but it can't be stolen, it can't be measured, and it can't be traded in for newer versions. And there's something really soulful about beauty. Now, all during this COVID time, many of us are hankering for a vacation in a beautiful place, I'm sure. Haven't we all gotten tired of our normal routines? We're at that six month period of uh, fatigue. Wouldn't we just love to get on a bus or a plane and go somewhere, well, beautiful? Why? Is it that beauty beckons? It's because it restores us on the inside. It restores us in our souls. So, I mean, think about it for a second. You wouldn't tramp, uh, choose to travel halfway around the world to see a clear-cut forest or an ugly copper mine or a tour of the garbage dumps of the cities of Europe, for instance, you choose to travel to places of extreme beauty. Everyone seeks it. Everyone wants it. Everyone has a desire to be restored on the inside. Now, interestingly enough, in the last 20 years or so, many people have studied this concept, the concept of beauty, awe, transcendence, and elation. And a couple of researchers by the name of Jonathan Haidt and Decker Keltner have studied the physiological responses to various aspects of beauty. In one of their famous uh, studies, half the group was shown slides of traumatic events like wars and uh, terror and scenes of violence and hatred. The other half was shown slides of flowers and mountains and rivers and streams. They measured the physiological responses, but that wasn't the whole study. Uh, the second part of the study was given to both groups. A batch of kittens was let into the room. And while the students picked up the critters and hugged them and caressed them, their physio physiological responses were measured. And what's really interesting, and maybe not surprising, is that the group that had seen all the traumatic uh, scenes of violence and hatred had the highest response to the beautiful little kittens. Their, their blood pressure went down, their cortisol went down, all of those kinds of things that you can measure. Uh, it, there was a great, great decrease in stress. And after many such studies in different modalities, Haight and his team concluded that not only does witnessing beauty give us tingles and shivers, which also can be measured, it creates a feeling of awe if the beauty is vast and almost believe unbelievable. I've never been to, but I'm imagining the Taj Mahal, for instance, a scene of kind of classic beauty that people are drawn to. But the researchers found that when people viewed scenes of such great beauty that they were literally stopped short and left gasping for air, that something really important became evident. There's a feeling that accompanies this kind of awe. And it is a feeling that as if the heart is opening or expanding in ways that you never thought possible. 
it's called elation, the feeling of elation. And so this elation feeling that follows beauty is something that happens very much inside our heart and soul. And it is characterized by a kind of a warmth for others, a sense of love and openness and expansiveness that makes them want to heal the world or love their neighbor or, I don't know, maybe go and have babies or something. That's how expansive this sense of elation can be. That's the power of beauty. So, hmm, do we take beauty for granted, do you think? I mean, all around us right now at this time of year, we are saturated with beauty. We take it for granted. Do we let it expand us on the inside in the way I'm describing the way these researchers have found. And here's the thing. I mean, if we practice beauty, then it becomes like a spiritual practice that, that feeds our souls on the inside and makes us want to heal the world. What could be bad with that? Every year in the wintertime, the company Expedia, which is an online travel company, markets their trips to sunny places with some pretty funny commercials. And I realize as soon as I talk about watching television commercials, I'm, I'm really dating myself. I mean, does anybody do that anymore? In one such commercial, though, a man is, is shoveling five or six feet of snow out of his laneway, and then the snow plow comes along, and he falls down in the snow crying and, and wailing. In another uh, scene, a woman woman is looking out of her office tower window at the gray bleakness of November, December afternoon while she's still at work and she's dreaming of going to a beautiful uh, beach, but she has this Edward Monch scream look on her face. And whenever I see that, I can totally resonate with that. I, I totally understand those, uh, those feelings. But in strange twists of art imitating life, doesn't our current contemporary culture remind us of those caricatures? We live our lives against, well, I'm going to just say an ugly backdrop. We live our lives against an ugly backdrop, a tremendously bleak landscape. I heard a fellow on CBC Ideas the other night suggesting that the current U.S. election has the potential to spark a violent civil war in that country. It made me feel slightly ill on the inside, which is a feeling that I'm kind of becoming used to during this whole COVID time, this feeling of, of sort of something really wrong resonating inside my own heart and soul. We turn on the news and the first 20 minutes is usually about the murders and the crimes of the day and way too much detail. And then, of course, the wall-to-wall -wall coverage of COVID numbers, which I know are there to scare us into following the protocols. But still, all of these things conspire to leave an Edward Monch scream look on our faces. And... This is a terrible way to live. It's not healthy. It's not good. Robert Sardello wrote that what's happening in our time is that the soul of the world is becoming diminished. That's quite an indictment. The soul of the world becoming diminished. He claims that what matters most to most people these days are kind of the three pillars of technology, science, and economics. And he says, while we all collectively obsess about those things, and he was writing about this long before anyone knew about COVID, he said, what happens is that our hearts shrink and our souls become less active. Now, he was speaking metaphorically because, of course, our hearts and our souls aren't physical things that, that sh uh, shrink. But what he meant was, our souls shrink in importance in our lives. And they shrink in agency as we learn to think of our souls as non-performative. And they shrink in effectiveness because 
we neglect to take any time at all to do soul work. One of the easiest things to do, well, that's why I'm giving you this sermon today, one of the easiest things to do in terms of soul work is to go outside and check out the beauty and cultivate a response to it. The world isn't broken so much as its soul has run dry. The lilies of the field, Jesus said, don't toil or spin cloth. They don't have jobs. They spring up from the ground when it's time. They flower when the sunlight beckons them to flower. Then they drop their leaves and wither to the ground before the frost so that the bulbs or the rhizomes or whatever it is that they grow from under the soil can rejuvenate. But note, after a season of growth, these beautiful flowers are larger. They enlarge in their growing. Now, Jesus often used these plain vanilla examples to teach spiritual lessons to us. But if you think a little less literally about this plain vanilla example, everything is a lily. Everything, or lilies, I mean, are everywhere. Everything is a lily, including you and I. We're planted, we bloom, we wither away. Our souls, though, are like the rhizome underground. After a lifetime of creating beauty, they expand, they grow. We become something more. Can you think of a time in our world more important for this truth than now? What will happen if the people of the world stopped every day to focus on beauty? And perhaps maybe a little more than that, taking notes as you go, maybe creating a biography of beauty for yourself. What would happen if the people of the world took it as their, their role to expand enough to create beauty wherever they walk? Richard Rohr once gave away a great secret in a talk that I heard him give once. He said that the real beauty in our human life is simply this, that an infinite God seeks to merge with the soul. So just want to say that again. He said that the real beauty of our human life is simply that an infinite God seeks to merge with, with our souls. So I've been mulling this phrase around in my head for quite a few years now, and I find it still puzzles me, not the fact of it, but, but the how. Like, how does an infinite God seek to merge with our souls how can that even be how can that even be true years ago when my first grandson was born to my son and his wife we had the occasion to hold little emerson in our arms many times those were beautiful and memorable times and i'm sure most of you have experienced similar things but the best time was when our son had one of those awe-inspired, heart-opening moments, and we were witness to it. We'd been holding the little one when my wife gently said, you know, Matt, holding this baby reminds me of all the many hours we held you when you were this age, when you were a newborn, and as you grew up. And just so you know, I guess she'd been waiting a lifetime to say this. She said, just so you know, we still love you the same way we did when we held you in our arms all those years ago. 
And our son, who's a person of very few words, not like me at all, paused and he said, sometimes I love him so much, I feel my heart breaking open. And in a flash of insight, he got it, right? He got it. His heart expanded with the awe of holding his own, his own little baby. Sometimes in church, we have to be hit over the head with things a number of times before we get them. And that's why in church, we tend to repeat things over and over. We, we say the same things every week, the Lord's Prayer. We, we have the same rituals uh, that we repeat every week or from time to time, like communion as we're doing today. Or we sing the same songs over and over, and we get to a point where we kind of know them by heart and maybe a little bit bored of them. But sometimes the beauty of a song can carry your heart for a day, or the words of a prayer can come back to you when you are walking through the woods and you decide then and there that you will act on making that prayer a reality in your world. Or you turn off the TV and you make a decision to do something beautiful, to create something nice for someone who is lonely or not dealing well with a concern in their life. So my point is, you don't have to walk around the Taj Mahal to be overwhelmed with beauty. You don't have to stand on top of the highest mountain to view the galaxies spinning in front of us. The gifts of life are right here right in front of us, even here in simple stuff like bread and juice. Here we practice being awed, being broken open, and having our hearts expand. Why? So that when we go into the world, we know what it is to be awed, to have our hearts broken open and expand enough to heal the world. Many blessings. Amen. And now our hymn is number 460, 460, All Who Hunger.
Well, even though it is COVID time, still it is Communion Sunday. And uh, even though we're all in our separate places and hardly connected at all, yet this meal brings us together. And our sharing of this communion is for uh, the elation and elevation of our world and for the healing of the world. So may God be with you. And may we lift up our hearts and give God thanks and praise. We give praise on this beauty-filled day for the richness and fullness of life. We give thanks for the deep spirit which runs through our lives and through the lives of all people on earth. We give thanks that all people, regardless of their life circumstances, may know the riches of the beauty of their soul. We give thanks for light and love, for peace and hope, for compassion and mercy. We give thanks for grace and for joy, for healing and care, for comfort and love. May all of these gifts be present with you now. And then when we break bread and share juice together, may these gifts be reborn in your hearts. We give thanks for the life and the love of Jesus, for he has taught us how to live, deeply connected to the spirit of life, deeply connected to the source of goodness and love, deeply connected to one another. We give thanks that when we break bread and share bread, we remind ourselves of the mystery of our faith, that we become the living body of Christ. We give thanks that when we pour out the wine, we remind ourselves of the fountain of abundant and eternal love, the deep love of our creator. So it is that we break the bread. We take the bread. We give thanks to God as Jesus did. And remember that he said, take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. And we remember that he took the wine and pouring it, said this wine is the blood of a new covenant between God and all of humanity. He took the wine and lifted it up and gave thanks to God for this gift. As we reflect on these gifts before us and remember that they are the gifts of God and how they become new life and new energy in us, a reminder of the new life God gives us each day, let us also remember those who are suffering those who are in pain, those who are facing the difficulties of this COVID time, those who are frontline workers, those who are in hospital or at home, those who are grieving, and those who are lonely. And now let's bring our hearts and our voices together in the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever amen Friends, this is the bread of life. I invite you to take it with me now.
This is the cup of blessing. I invite you to take it now. And now, as the body of Christ, may we live with beauty, may we bring beauty into this world, may we refresh the beauty around us and create beauty wherever we walk. Amen. So our last hymn is hymn number 260, 260, God who gives to life its goodness. Friends, let us go to the world with a tender and a daring love. May all that we do be done in a spirit of love and grace, and may we find beauty in every corner of our lives. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be yours today and forever. Amen. And now we'll have our postlude. Go now in peace. <laughs>